Yeah, well, should we get started? I think we've, we've got 30 people here. A couple more people might, yeah. might join us. Um, so hello, everybody. Um, welcome to the webinar. Uh, I'm going to hand over to Justin fairly quickly, but there are just a couple of updates that I just wanted to mention to you all. So firstly, shielding. Um, so at the beginning of this lockdown, people who are clinically extremely vulnerable were asked to shield until the 22nd of February, which is, is a matter of days. Um, so this has now been extended to the 31st um, of March, and they're also extending the, extending the people that will get a lesser as well. So you might find people in your community sort of asking you about it. Um, so yeah, 1.7 million people across um, England will be getting a letter to say that they will now, now need to shield. So keep an eye out for that. Um, in terms of the lateral flow testing sites, um, the NIA um, closed yesterday evening. So from this morning, the Hippodrome, just down the road, has been opened instead. Uh, it's open seven days a week between 8 a.m. and 6. Um, and also in terms of the mobile sites, so Blakesley Hall, which I think is, I think, B25, um, that will open from next week. There's been a slight delay. Um, and that will be open 10 till 2 and 4 till 8. Um, but I'm sure you'll find out lots more later on because today's webinar is about testing. Um, just a couple of, of house rules first. So please use the chat box if you want to ask any questions. And the only people that should be answering the questions are, are the hosts or Dr. Justin Varney, really. Um, please keep your questions short and concise as possible, just so we can get through as, as many as possible. And as, as much as we love to see all your faces, please turn off your video as well. It just helps with the bandwidth. Um, but yeah, I'll, uh, I'll pass you over to Justin. That's always the joy of getting myself unmuted <laughs> at the right time. So what I'm going to do, uh, everyone, and great, great to see you again. I know you've not had me with you for a little while, is I'm going to give a, a quick update of where we are in the numbers. And then I'm going to talk about testing, um, because what we really want to do in today's session is get some engagement with you and some feedback from you on how we can improve uh, testing uptake uh, across the city. So. Let's see whether we can get this to uh, work. So I share my screen and hopefully you can now see a uh, slideshow. So Holly, can you just uh, confirm that you can see it? Yeah, all good, all good to me, yeah. Brilliant, okay. So as usual, this is when my computer decides it wants to go a bit slow. Uh, there we go, all right. So um, in terms of where we are in terms of the, the case rates, um, we're seeing case rates starting to come down and deaths are starting to come down as well, which is brilliant news. Hospital admissions coming down a little bit more slowly. Um, and what's really good news actually is our cases in our over 60s now is lower than our case rate in our over 60s. So some real signs that, that national lockdown is doing exactly what we expect it to do. Um, and on this graph, you can clearly see that the impact it's had bringing these numbers down. Um, and what government is now starting to do is think through how do we avoid what happened in November? So you can see <clears throat> back in the November lockdown, we locked down for a month. We came out of lockdown and two weeks later, case rates were rapidly rising. So what government's now trying to plan is a relaxation of lockdown, which is much, much more cautious so that we can try and avoid going back into lockdown before the summer um, and get a reasonably long period in order um, to, to kind of get a reasonable level of normality for as long as possible. So that's why I think we will see a much more cautious relaxation uh, of lockdown. And obviously the government will make announcements on that next week. When we look at case rates by different parts of the city, um, so this is slightly different from the data you got on Monday, um, but frankly, obviously has had a lot of testing. So we found a lot of the cases in frankly through the Operation Eagle testing, and that's why they're running slightly higher. But what's interesting is it's not putting them actually massively higher um, than some of the other areas in the top 10. Um, and that reassures me in a sense, because it suggests that we're finding cases in people who didn't have symptoms and didn't know, and frankly, but we're not finding that the case rate in frankly is astronomically higher than, than anywhere else in the city. When we look at the, the case rate distribution by different ages, what you can see is the darker the color means the higher the case rate. 
Um, and in this uh, plot, you can see that the highest case rates are really in working age adults in that group between 20 and 60. And pretty persistently, either our 40 to 45 year olds or our 30 to 35 year olds are the highest case rates. Um, obviously, the 90 year olds and above on the top is quite dark as well, but there's a very small number of them in the city. So that's kind of slightly skewed by small numbers, whereas there are lots and lots of 30 and 40 year olds. Um, so we, we do need to drive down that, that case rate in working age adults particularly. We also now have better data on rates by different ethnicities. Um, and what this is showing is that we have higher uh, case rates in some of our ethnic communities, but all of our case rates are falling in different ethnic communities. And when I come on to talk a bit about testing, you'll see that I'm not confident that this is really a true picture because some of our communities have really slowed down their testing, particularly our Pakistani, Bangladeshi and Indian communities. So when I look at this, I'm not sure whether it's because there was less COVID or because they've just stopped testing because they're fed up of doing testing. So you know, it, it's not, we're not, can't be confident yet that this is a real reflection for those communities where testing rates have really fallen. We also do look at uh, uh, case rates um, by deprivation. So looking at the relationship with poverty and case rates. Um, and this does show that our poorer communities are more affected, but actually they are coming down uh, much more. And when we look at testing rates, uh, by deprivation, actually testing rates are higher in some of our poorer communities. And that probably reflects the number of people who work in uh, lower paid jobs in our care sector, for example, and they're testing regularly because of work. So that's all I wanted to say on the numbers this week. And, and I wanted to move a bit more on to uh, the testing discussion. I don't know, Holly, if there are any questions anyone wanted to ask about the numbers just before I go on to the uh, the testing bit. Um, we haven't had any questions about the numbers. Uh, we do have a question that might be worth perhaps doing now around shielding, just based on what I was saying before. Um, Carol asks, is it recommended that those shielding should do so if they've had one or two vaccines? Yes, so at the moment, vaccine makes no difference to your shielding guidance or to your testing guidance. Now that may change in time, but it doesn't at the moment. And that's partially because the vaccines take time to work. So even after your second dose, it takes about three to four weeks for that second dose to really have its impact. So there are a very, very small number of people at the moment who've had both doses and are a month clear of the second dose. Um, so I think we will see some change in that guidance, but probably not until after Easter, I'm afraid, um, where more people have had both doses and we know that second dose has had time to work. Thank you. And we've got one here from Deborah as well. Um, just saying that the advantage of the mobile testing sites is great. Well, they're open to late, which is fantastic. Um, are, any more going, are any more going to be opened um, that will be open yeah. to late? Yeah, so let's let's move on to talk a bit about testing, shall we? Because that's that's what we wanted to kind of get people's thoughts on. And I'll pick that up as I talk a bit about uh, testing. So um, first of all, why do we want to test for people? Well, we want we want people to test because as an individual, you want to know whether you're infected or infectious. So you can stop spreading the virus and don't give it to someone um, because you don't want to infect them. So at an individual level, testing's important because we all want to know when we're sick and we want to know if our symptoms are caused by COVID or by something else. But it's also important that at a population level, we get people to test because it helps us find cases and that helps prevent the spread, but it also helps us understand the pattern of disease and how that spread is happening through community. So if people aren't testing, um, it's a bit like trying to do a jigsaw puzzle and half the pieces are missing or you can't, just can't see half the pieces. It's very difficult to work out what the picture actually is. So it's really important that we have testing to be able to understand how COVID is spreading through our communities. Now, there are two different types of, of tests for COVID infection. I'm not going to talk about the antibody test which is a blood test. And that's because you can't get it on the NHS. 
and frankly at the moment it's a waste of time um, it's a waste of money as well because um, we know that most people who develop antibodies through natural infection it wears off quite quickly um, and there's no point spending 200 quid to find out if your vaccine gave you antibodies um, because we know it will give you antibodies so I would save you money and, and ignore that for the moment. So the two tests we have for, for infection are two different ones. There's PCR test and a lateral flow test. So the PCR test, swab to the back of your nose, back of your throat, get sent off to the lab. Fancy machines at the lab uh, track down tiny amounts of virus on the swab. So it's a really accurate test for finding COVID, even when there's a very small amount in your body. And that's why we can use it for people who've got symptoms where we're trying to make sure it is or isn't COVID, or we use it in settings like care homes where they're very high risk settings. It's quite an expensive test and there are, we've got a limited number of those test kits. So that's why we don't use it all the time. And it also takes about a day for the results to come through, which is the other reason we don't use it all the time. So that's for people who've got symptoms. The lateral flow test, same swab to the back of your nose, back of your throat. But instead of being sent to the lab, it's used with a little kit in front of you. And that's got some special paper inside it that detects the surface proteins on the virus. So it's basically looking at the virus's coat. Um, and it can only really be uh, detected if there's lots of the virus on that swab. So the test is very, very good at finding people who are infectious because when you're most infectious, you've got loads of virus in, in your nose and your throat. What it's not very good at is detecting people when they've only just got infected and there's very little virus there because it would depend on you getting the swab right spot in the back of your nose, capturing the virus exactly and getting it onto the bit of, of paper. So it's that's why we use it to test people who haven't got symptoms to try and find the people who are infectious but don't have symptoms. And we know about a third of people who are infectious don't have symptoms. Lateral flow test, quick, cheap, uh, get a result in about 30 minutes. Um, it's more accurate when it's done in a testing centre rather than people doing it at home. Um, and that's why at the moment you can't get them as home test kits. That might change over time because the technology is improving. But that's one of the reasons it isn't given out uh, for people to use at home, is because we know from, from the evidence, people use it at home, don't tend to um, use it correctly, and therefore it doesn't give an accurate reading. But you can find information on the council website about both of these tests. In terms of our symptomatic testing locations, we've got 12 across the city, two drive through, two walk through, and I think you've, you've had these before. Um, we're not planning to open up any more of these sites uh, and then managed by the Department of Health rather than by the council. In terms of the lateral flow sites, um, and these are the ones I think it was Debbie was saying before, it's great to have some open to eight o'clock. Um, these are the ones that the council run or we commission someone to, to provide for us. Um, some of them you need appointments and some of them you can walk up. Um, and the details are all on the council website because we're continually adding new sites, um, particularly new pharmacy sites. We've closed the site, as Holly said, at the National Arena. That's because they need it for sport. Um, so we've moved it to the Hippodrome from today. Um, and there's also spokes now at King Standing, Sheldon, Hansworth and Chardend. And the mobile units we've moved to, the, to Lighthouse at Aston, Maypole Youth Centre and Heartlands Resource Centre. And we will be moving the one at Maypole to Blakesley Hall Museum next week. But when we do, a new spoke is gonna open at the Maypole Youth Centre, which will be a fixed spoke. So what we're trying to do with the mobile units is as we move it around, if it's got a good footfall and it looks like it's a good site to turn into a fixed site, that's what we're doing. We've got 71 pharmacies now live, 100 have been trained. So that's growing as well at the moment. What I wanted to really focus on was show you a bit about what happens in terms of the uptake of testing across the city. So this is the uptake of, of the PCR test, the one that goes to the lab. Um, and the little dark blot in the, the bottom left hand corner 
of Birmingham. That's all the extra testing we were doing in Frankly for the Operation Eagle. But as you can see, the city's pretty much the same color all over. That's the same kind of uptake of testing. And that's what I want to see, a nice even cover color across the city, pretty good uptake. And the map on the right shows you where we're finding positives. And as you can see, there's little dots of dark purple all over the city. So this is for people primarily with symptoms. This is the map for people with, with lateral flow testing, so testing of people without symptoms. And this is the bit I'm more concerned about. You can see in the central band of the city, there's like this giant ball spot. And that's been pretty consistent now for the last month. And that's why we wanted to have this conversation with you today about what can we do to increase the uptake of lateral flow testing because in, we're bottom of the, the rank across the West Midlands. There are lots of testing sites in this area of the city, so it's not they aren't there, but people aren't really engaging with them. And as you can see from the map on the right, we find less positives with lateral flow, but we are finding them dotted all over the place. And in general, where there's more lateral flow being done, we're finding more positives. And that's great because we're finding people that are infectious don't have symptoms so could be for example being in a care bubble popping into their mum and doing the shopping cooking her a meal and they might be giving her covid and not know it and that's why the lateral flow is so important is it's a really good way of trying to find people who might be spreading it and don't know it when we look at some of the analysis of testing what we're seeing is the top top set of lines are all age groups so you can see there's not a huge amount of change when we look at age, there's a slight increase in testing in, in the uh, 18 to 24, um, uh, but pretty much the, the testing rate has stayed pretty stable. But if we look at the bottom graph, which is ethnicity, these lines, this bright green line at the top, which starts out right at the top of testing rates back in the beginning of January, has dropped right down over January and February, and that's our Pakistani community. Um, whereas if we look at our white community, which is the blue line, starts off kind of, I suppose, middle of the pack, goes down a bit and then really comes up. That's what's happened in Frankly, I think, that's really driven up testing in the white community. So what we're seeing is that there, is, there are some differences between different ethnic communities in terms of testing uptake. And that's why I'm not as confident that we're really seeing improvement in case rates in all of our communities. Um, and there has been this quite big drop off at the end of January uh, across many communities. So what we want to focus on using the Mentimeter thing, which I think you, you um, used last time, and Holly will put up a slide in a minute with the, the link and the code that we're using this time. We wanna ask you a couple of questions and get you to use the Mentimeter to help us understand what can we do to increase uptake particularly in people that can't work from home, so the people that are going to work, people who are in care and support bubbles, what can we do to get uptake better? Because um, somehow we need to find ways to get more of us testing regularly, because that's a key part of getting out of lockdown. And it's one of the things the government is looking at is not just um, what's happening with case rates, they're also looking at what's happening in testing rates, um, and how frequently people are testing. So it's really important that we can encourage people uh, to do that. So Holly, can you pop up the slide with the Mentimeter? I can, bear with me. And I can see, I'll pick up some of the questions and discussion in the chat about people asked. So one of the things that was asked about why can't people get a free NHS test to travel um, that's no different from, from what we've done for other things in the past. So, for example, if you need to have a, a medical certificate to travel or a vaccine uh, for, for traveling to a particular country, the NHS doesn't pay for it. So it's exactly the same uh, on, on this point of view. Um, and that's that's the kind of same approach that's being taken here. So I think you know, that's why it's not free on the NHS. It's you choose to travel, therefore you have to pay for the, the test uh, at the moment. Um, and um, 
one of the things we've been doing around uh, about access, as Deborah says, is we've been trying to move the, the mobile units around, increase access as well for people uh, across the city. Um, and um, just picking up at the other ones. Um, uh, Paula raised the point about primary school um, staff testing regularly. And yes, that, that's true. And that's, um, that's rolling out. Also testing in secondary school has been going really well with children being tested at school uh, and at school sites. Now at the moment that there, there are some pilots nationally of giving test kits to parents to test children at home if they're contacts of cases. Um, and that's what's called test and release. Um, but they are pilots because there is a lot of anxiety about whether people will actually do them properly and report the, the right results. Um, and we recommend that people take a lateral flow test back every three to four days if they can't work from home. Um, some people will now be able to get it through their workplaces. And uh, I think two weeks ago, businesses were able to ask to join the scheme where they would get lateral flow kits, but they have to set up testing sites at the workplace. So it's not an easy feat to do this. And you know, as you will have seen, getting um, getting the, getting these sites set up does take time uh, at the moment. Um, so let's move into the Mentimeter, Holly May. So these are uh, questions to, to help us understand the COVID uh, testing behaviour. So should we go into the first? So first of all, remind everyone, go to www.mentimeter.com. Um, Jack's just put the link in the chat as well. So you can click on that link. Um, if you're on a phone, you can click on it as well and it will take you through your, your phone browser. Um, and if it asks you for the code, it's 5309. 532. So we'll just give everyone a second to get that um, up and open. Sure. And you should get a lovely green screen with a heart in the middle of it that says help us understand COVID testing behaviour. Great. OK, well, let's go on to the, the first question, shall we, Holly? And Let's see if we can get it to uh, work. Yeah, let's have a look. OK, so the first question is, have you taken a COVID test before? And there is, there is no right or wrong answer here. Please, you know, please just uh, answer honestly. <laughs> Great, so it's coming in mixed and match at the moment. And while people are adding up, Deborah asked about if someone lives outside of Birmingham, can they book a test in Birmingham uh, and vice versa? So basically um, people who live or work in Birmingham can book tests. There isn't a thing that stops you booking because of your postcode, but obviously we don't want a massive influx from people that don't live here and don't work here. Um, and certainly at the walk up sites, um, you don't get turned away. I haven't seen anyone turned away because they live in the wrong place. So certainly when we stood up the NIA, we were one of the, the first local authorities after Wolverhampton to set up a big testing site. And we did get some people traveling to come and get a test because they couldn't get one locally. So some people will test at home, some people will test uh, closer to work, but across the West Midlands, there are these sites, so it should be helpful. Great. So, Holly, do we think we've, we've got to kind of balance now with most people? Have done yeah, so there's, there's 42 people in the webinar and about 30 people are using Menti. Uh, the remaining 10 people, are, are you having problems? Want to pop anything in the chat? Yeah, do. If you're having problems with mm -hmm. Menti, just pop it in the chat and then Jack or Holly will, will privately message you and can help you. Uh, just help you get going on it. But that's brilliant. So it's interesting. It's about half and half in terms of people who've had a test or not um, and that's really helpful for us because it gives us a bit of a sense or oh, there's some late covers balancing no. <laughs> now <laughs> which is great okay well let's let's go on to the next uh question shall we sure so great so, oh are you, no you, you go justin <laughs> yeah so this question's about asking you know, when you did the test what motivated you to do it so was it because you had symptoms was it because you were curious to know whether you had COVID or not? Uh, was it because work asked you? 
Had you been asked by someone in public health or was there another reason? Um, and if it was another reason, just pop it in the chat box, other and then hyphen and the reason, because it will help us understand a bit about what other reasons people might have um, to, uh, to do it. This is the bit I love about Mentimeter. It's like watching little bubbles in the bath joining up and making bigger bubbles. <laughs> uh, so I think it's always a, a great fun. Great, so that's interesting. A couple of people put in the, in the chat, um, they took it because they were traveling or they were part of one of the studies, um, which is really interesting. So if we did this together, we might need to put research as an option. So that's a, a good, good one to know. Uh, a lot of people because of, of symptoms more than anything else. A um, few more people doing it now at the moment. Yeah, Magda, your other reason, I think that's because you're curious, because you wanted to know, be able to tell other people how it works. And I have to say, when I went first to have my lateral flow, my first time I went was because I was curious. I wanted to see it and I wanted to be able to experience it myself. So when I come and talk to citizens and do word forums, I can, um, you know, can honestly say I've had this test. I know what it's like. Um, I know it's not very nice to have a swab in the back of your nose and your throat, um, but it is important. Um, so that's uh, a really important one. And Deborah sharing you, you were doing it because you support your mum and you didn't want to uh, pass anything on to her. And I think that's a really important message. And I think it's possibly one we're not getting out loudly enough to carers um, is actually if you um, if you are helping someone, you care for someone, informally like you do their shopping for mum or dad that kind of thing actually testing regularly with lateral flow really does protect them really reduces your chance doesn't mean you can go in for a hug because these things are not 100% uh, accurate but they are pretty good and it, it just gives you that extra bit of confidence um, which is good um, yeah okay great so should we move on to the next one now Holly yeah, sure. Yeah. Great. So this one is, um, do you think people in your community who can't work from home are regularly getting tested? So we want to kind of get your sense of the people you know in your kind of social network, in your family who, who have to go to work, can't work from, from their spare room like me and Riz. Um, you know, are they testing regularly or are they not? Because it'd be really helpful to get a sense of that. Well, that's quite coming out really quite strongly, isn't it? Great. And that that's, I have to say, that's why I like Mentimeter because it's a great way of you being able to tell us things like this. And, and for me, that really says we need to do more with workplaces and with employers to help reiterate to people, you need to get this test regularly. Um, because it is, is really helpful and, and great to hear from Magda about actually how this gives a bit of peace of mind for people who are going to work. Because it, it does, as I said, it's not perfect, but it really does help uh, reduce. Um, and Carol asked a really good question. If you're partly vaccinated, so I'll take that as having one, one dose and you're bubbled with someone like a, an eight year old parent, should you still do the LFD before, te before visiting? I would say yes, I, you know, there's, um, the vaccine makes no difference to the lateral flow test because it's, it's looking for a different thing. Um, so I would, I would do it and keep doing it. Um, certainly if you've only had one dose and, and probably for a good four to six weeks after the second dose, just to be on the safe side. So I would, I would really go with that. I think it's a really important one um, about it. Um, and Alison raised the point about factories and, and some employers saying you'll lose your job if you don't if you test. Um, we're really coming down on that. And if we get whistleblowed, so if people use the whistleblowing portal to tell us, um, we um, we come down on it quite hard. Uh, and we actually, I was having, I've got a national conversation tomorrow about this 
because it's something I've been really, really vocal about nationally is that government needs to be clear that businesses who tell staff not to test should be dealt with with the most severe penalty by HSE. It's not acceptable. Um, it's really important. Um, great. So let's go on to the next question, Holly. So this is one where I think you get to put in um, some uh, words. It's not. Oh, here we go. Yeah. So you can you can write uh, a couple of words. You can write one or two words. You can write a short paragraph. You've got two hundred and fifty characters. So it's a bit like doing a long tweet. Um, you can't write an essay. Um, but if you, you put in there some of the things about why do you think people are, aren't getting tested, some of the stuff that people have put in the chat, please do put in here as well. Stephen's just made a really good point about people kind of going, I feel fine, so I'm not going to test. Um, and as I said, we know a third of people who feel fine have COVID and are infectious. So, it, it, you know, that's one of the reasons to test. Uh, about it. So yeah, do you use the, this couple of things coming in? I think one of the downsides in Mentimeter on this one is you can't like what other people have done. So you can't go, yeah, yeah, yeah I agree with it. So if you do see one that you think, yeah, I really agree with that, put it in again, because that shows us that you're agreeing with it. That's how it, the system kind of works. Can you scroll down on your screen a bit, Holly, so we can see what's coming through? Thank you. Oh, now you've drawn a, a line. Oh, I didn't know I could do that. I'm sorry, everybody. <laughs> no, I didn't know you could do either. Um, great. Oh, I think those yellow lines might have to stay there for this one. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's all right. So it's interesting looking at what people said. There's there's some stuff coming through about not really understanding testing. Um, there's some things about the concern about not being able to work seems to be there a couple of times. Um, language barrier. Uh, as well. What else have we got? Uh, interesting one about people not feeling safe at the lateral flow centers. Um, do I find, I think that plays over in some of the people concerns that people have about going to the GP or going to the pharmacy. You know, frankly, I think you're a lot safer in a lateral flow centre than you are in a supermarket at the moment. Um, you know, so they, they are designed to try and uh, protect people and make sure people are safe. Um, and certainly in the, in the council ones, you tend to go into a testing booth, a bit like a voting booth. So um, when you're sticking the swab in your nose, et cetera, it's not like you can flick it at someone else. Um, there is a kind of barrier there as well. Um, okay, yeah, some interesting stuff coming out. This is really helpful, guys. It's exactly what we needed to, to kind of hear from you to help, help us shape uh, what we do. Um, and I know there was a, a question in the chat about where to uh, go for the whistleblowing. So I've just put the link again into the chat about how you can whistleblow. And we'll make sure that's reinforced in next week's Champion Cascade as well. Great. So lots of really, really good stuff here uh, coming through. Yeah, the signage outside of the testing sites, really good point. One we've picked up. So we've just actually paid for a whole series of pop up banners that can go up in, in front of sites because um, we're now like just over a month in. Uh, and now we know we've got sites that are fixed. We can we can do that and get that signage up. Um, so I think that's coming through as well. Um, and the internet access point is a really important one. One of the reasons we do these sessions with the COVID champions is we're really hoping you share the information with your friends that don't have internet access um, and help them get access to the information. Um, and similarly, we are also working with our engagement partners to develop telephone trees. So this is like real old school, uh, back before the, we had the internet, where say I'd ring Riz, Riz would ring all his mates, uh, and eventually that would probably get through to Holly May. Uh, sorry to keep picking on you, Riz, you're like my second picture along, so that's why. Um, but it, you know, and, and what it meant is I didn't need to ring Holly May directly because I knew she'd get the information through the telephone tree. 
So it's a really nice model uh, and we've got some extra funding we were given to develop that. So that will be standing up over the next couple of weeks, I hope, uh, which I think will be really, really good as well. Um, one of the, uh, the points that was made just at the bottom was about, um, uh, just go up a little bit, Holly, that bit about Maypole. Yeah, so the point on Maypole is when we move the site from Maypole, it's going to be replaced with a, a fixed site. So we're going to have a semi-permanent site there once the mobile unit goes, and that will be open seven days a week, and you won't need to book an appointment because it will be one of the council sites. So it will be open seven days a week at the Maypole Youth Centre, and that will probably happen from the 23rd of February. We're just getting the staff in place and everything else uh, set up as well. Um, and yeah, I think the point, and, and we're doing, we're looking at how can we get posters up, and, and you know whether we need to leaflet, for example, uh, people that live in the local area. So go really old school uh, out as well. Um, and the point about just that final point at the bottom, I want to just pick up, Holly, the point about people with mobility issues um, and whether we'll do more face to face, uh, sorry, house to house testing. Um, we're just reflecting on that after all the work we've done in Frankly um, about, and you remember we used to do drop and collect back in the summer. Um, and so we're going to try and put forward a proposal to the Department of Health to get testing kits to be able to do that in areas where we've got lower testing uptake as well, because it has gone really well at Frankly, actually. Um, so we're quite keen to, to look at, can we, can we do that again uh, and think about it? Um, but it's really important for the people that, um, who are visiting and caring and supporting those individuals with mobility issues, they really need to get a test. So if you look after someone who can't get to a testing site regularly, um, there's even more responsibility for you to get a test regularly. And I think that that's really important. So really fantastic stuff here. And, and as Alison said, there's a lot of, um, of this resonates. And, and we wanna try and do this more with champions because I'm really keen that we get more of a two way with you guys. And this is your opportunity to tell us what you think. Um, so this is our kind of, I'm not sure whether we've done Mentimeter like this before, have we Holly May with them? Uh, no, we haven't. No, this is the first okay. time. So, so we've been learning to use this. This is my new toy, basically, <laughs> the new toy for the team. So we've been using it in a couple of uh, workshops over the last month or so. So I'm really glad we're able to use this with you because I, I think it's a great way of, of getting uh, this. And at the end of the session, we get to keep all of this and we can download it and then really um, and, and pull it together. So it, it's a bit easier to read this than it is pulling stuff out of the chat, which is helpful as well. So let's go on to the, um, the next uh, question. Oh, that's the last one we were doing. I forgot that. Oh. Uh, no, that's fine. That's great. So that, that's been super helpful from my point of view in terms of, um, of getting uh, a sense of, of what you think we could do differently. If you've got other thoughts, do email the team um, and let them know as well, because what we're doing now is we're kind of halfway through uh, our testing approach. And so it's a really good time for us to do a bit of reflection and go, how can we make it better? How can we make it more accessible? Um, and one of the things I really want to do, as I said, is work more with you as champions so that you're, you can see how what you tell us makes a difference. And that's one of the key bits, you know, being a champion is not just about us giving you loads of information. It's also about you telling us uh, what, what would make a, a difference. So I think everyone's put stuff in their chat uh, now. Um, and um, I'll just touch on the, I had a question in the chat from Angela about South African variant. So I'll just touch on that now before I hand back to Holly. Um, so where we are on, on South African variant, um, we've had the case, in, the cases in Frankly, uh, we finished testing yesterday. So we wait, we're just still getting through the numbers of how many people have tested and the results of how many tested positive. And then it'll take about another 10, 10 days before we know whether we found any more South African variant or not. Um, so that's the kind of timeline. 
but I am really pleased um, the people of Frankly, Northfield, Rubri and Rednall absolutely stepped up. Um, we've, we've absolutely, you know, throw, hit it out the park when it comes to the numbers of people testing. And that's absolutely what I wanted to see. Um, and what we know is that that will drive up the case numbers in Frankly for a little bit. And then I'm hoping they'll come crashing down and stay down for quite a long time because so many people have tested that we've kind of found all the COVID and then people are can't, you know, not spreading it, behaving themselves, et cetera, and it all kind of stays under control. So we will um, see how that plays out. Um, Rhys, can I just check with you before I hand back to Holly, will you be able to cover the shielding bit or do you want me to talk about the shielding extension? I can talk about shielding if you want to. Brilliant. Okay, so uh, on that note, I'll hand back to, to Holly. Uh, and as ever, I have to do a runner and go and do uh, another session, uh, which I'm doing, I think, with First Legacy Foundation tonight uh, for African and Caribbean community. But um, final for me is thank you so much. You guys are really making a difference. I'm so, every time I get a little tidbit back from communities that I talk to, ward forums, where people said, oh, I heard this from a champion, that, that makes me really happy um, because that's exactly what you guys are doing is making a difference in your communities. And there is absolutely no way we could achieve what we're doing uh, without your help. And now we're over 700. We've still got a bit away. Remember my target's 1,500. So go nobble your mates and get them signed up as well. Um, but thanks everyone. I'll hand back to Holly May now. Thanks, Justin. Thank you very much. Um, Riz, do you want to give an update um, in terms of the vaccine rollout? Yes, thank you very much. So um, apologies to start off with because the data I have is as of 7th of February, which is a little bit old. Um, but at that point, nationally, we've done about 10,992,000 uh, vaccines and we had done about 238,000 vaccines in Birmingham. That's obviously a lot, lot more are higher now, um, a few days down the line. Um, but I think comparably we, we're doing about a fifth of the, the, the national number. <laughs> Excuse me. And that's, Bless you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. And that's fairly consistent. I think uh, in terms of the figures, as we go down the cohorts to the over 65s and those who are extremely vulnerable and uh, in the shielding lists, so the uptake has been fairly good. We have some data around uh, constituencies about how the uptake has been in terms of age groups. Now, um, it's no surprise that um, in most uh, constituencies, we have had between 85 to 90% uptake within the over 80s, 75 to 70, 79s, 70, 75s and uh, carers as well. As well, Carers have been slightly less uh, in terms of 70, 75%. Um, Erdington, the, um, the uptake has been fairly good and consistent. Um, Edgebaston, the same, Whole Green, slightly less in the Spark Brook and uh, Bolsall Heath area, but otherwise fairly consistently high everywhere else and Spark Hill unfortunately about 66% Spark Group 57% Hodge Hill constituency again Alum Rock 59% but then Bromford Hodge Hill has been 86% Glebe Farm 81% uh, Small Heath 66% so I think if I go I could go through all the constituencies but I would I don't want to waste all your time but it seems like it's the normal uh, suspects that we we were expecting low uptake, which uh, which is in the uh, um, ethnic minority communities, particularly Asian ethnic minorities and Afro Caribbean ethnic minority com uh, communities, where the uptake has been less than consistent, around about fifty five to 65 percent, whereas in most other parts of the city, it's been about eighty five ninety percent. To be fair. So that's that's the the bit about um, the vaccination uptake. The um, the sites remain the same in terms of the Millennium Point and uh, Aston Villa, um, and we also have the three hospital sites, the the GP sites as well. Um, we are now looking at 
uh, perhaps a few other sites now that we're going down the cohort and the numbers are getting higher. So I've been told that a few other mosques will be coming on board as a vaccination site uh, in, uh, in, in the first week of March, essentially. And the CCG has been talking to a lot of other faith-based communities and community centers around getting a mobile site out to them. Now, the idea of the mobile site is that if a center or uh, either a community center or a faith-based center is able to book up to 24 or 48 people for a vaccination, we are quite happy to, to devote a session with the vaccines and the staff and the van to come out and give the vaccines there. Um, so this, this will be open to any uh, community center or any um, faith-based center where we, we can pretty much go up and, uh, and, and encourage people, those who have not yet taken the vaccine, to, to do so. And these are everyone over the age of 65. So we are hoping to work more closely with the communities where the uptake is low to, to make this possible. And we're working through the details at the moment as a CCG before we go out to offer to most uh, centers and we take it further from there. Regarding the shielding, which uh, Justin wanted me to cover, um, I think the, the idea was that the modeling was looking at certain more factors in, in the demographics around about asthma being one of them. So if you've had more than three uh, doses of steroids ever in your life, uh, then you form a, a higher risk category uh, and you would therefore be advised to shield. And I think we have now identified 1.7 uh, million people who, who, who have additional letters from the NHS to shield as a result. And obviously with this will come priority for the vaccination as well. So I'm sure you'll be hearing from your GPs or the NHS, uh, and, I'm, and I'm pretty certain that most letters have either already gone out or are on their way out. So this is to, to look at, particularly for, with asthma, to look at those who are more at risk of getting exacerbation of asthma and respiratory illnesses, uh, as opposed to when we were previously looking at um, uh, shielding with those who were extremely vulnerable, so people like COPD who are having more exacerbations over, over the year, perhaps two or more. So I think that, that, that this is a slightly more uh, extended uh, sort of uh, cohort of people who we feel should take extra care and should get priority for vaccination particularly. Thank you. We've had a couple of questions here. Um, so a few have been answered, but there's one from um, Alison, uh, why in some areas is the vaccine rollout perhaps a bit slower than, than other places? And mentioned here is West Heath, Longbridge, Rubri, frankly. Are you, are you able to shed some light, Riz? Yes, um, I think the, 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 these are logistical issues. I think uh, what you may have found that these areas may have started slightly earlier, but there were other areas like East Birmingham who st started later because we didn't have enough people in our 80 plus cohort. So what's happening now is that places like East Birmingham are catching up so that we can get the numbers higher on, on that end. So I, I think this is a national push model for vaccines. Uh, they are looking at some sort of equity in terms of vaccines going out to different areas. So those areas who may have perhaps started earlier now getting slightly less number of vaccines as opposed to those who would didn't get enough at the start, and therefore we sort of it's a big a big national balancing act with more than probably twenty eggs which we're trying to juggle at the, at the same time. <laughs> Thank you. And and Stephen asks, um, is the data that you've referenced available to the public, or is is it just for for staff? At the moment, it's just for staff. Um, but as we are getting more refined data from ethnic uh, populations or regarding the vaccine uptake, because essentially the pinnacle data that we were collecting initially was not collecting any ethnicity data, but now it has. So as we're getting more and more refined, it will be something that will be published in the public domain in, in due course. 
Thank you. We've had a couple of questions from people that are interested in the idea that um, a white van could come to, to a site, like a faith setting, for example, yeah. and administer the vaccine. So can you, can you just clarify the amount of people that someone would need to have at the venue, for example, and, and how yeah. people get involved in this as well? Yeah, so basically the first thing to say that is, is that we don't want to delay vaccination in those just because they're waiting for the vaccination to come at their site. So if they are able to go to the mass vaccination sites at the Millennium Point or Aston Villa, that would be something that would be useful. However, if a venue has more than 28 people that they can book, then it would be something that if they send us an expression of interest, we would be more than happy to, to have a look at a session. And the idea is to reach the, those hard to get populations. For So for instance, we, we're targeting mosques uh, because we know most, uh, the uptake in the Muslim population has been slightly lower than expected. So therefore, when they come and see their peers being vaccinated, it gives them the encouragement to, to be vaccinated at the same time. So I think I know now that I've put this out in the public domain, there'll be a lot more asks about people wanting to get a vaccination van. Absolutely no problem with that. But obviously uh, we need to prioritize the number of sites with the number of resources that we've got available as well. So if you are interested, perhaps send the COVID champions um, an email, like the, the normal email that you'd use, and then we can liaise with, um, with Riz. Yeah. I've got a couple more questions around how shielding has been extended to 1.7 million people. Um, so does the shielding for asthma cover children and adults? There's also a question here from Jane Haynes about the obesity factor as well, if you're able to. Yeah, so that, that is mainly for adults at the moment. The, ch uh, the children, unless if they've got very severe asthma, uh, they're not included in the shielding list. But of course, if they've had more than three doses of steroid ever in within the, their, their lifespan, then they would be included. So it's about severity of disease rather than otherwise. Um, the second question was, uh, sorry, what was the second question? Sorry, I didn't, I didn't read it out very well. So on the obesity factor, oh, how yes. up to date are health records on a patient's weight and BMI? And should patients who know they have a high BMI be contacting their GP? I think if uh, most people would have either had a well person check or will have had a chronic disease uh, check, which includes their weight and height with most GPs. So a lot of the records will have, uh, a lot of GP records will have uh, BMI included within them because they're part of most of the chronic disease management uh, that we would do routinely as part of our normal care. So uh, you don't need to contact your GP of course, if you haven't seen your GP in the, in the last few years, or if there's been a major change in your weight, or your, well, I hope not your height, but uh, your, height, your weight particularly, then yes, please contact your GP and, and, and make that, uh, that known to them and make that information available. But I, I think, yes, uh, that we should have that data to be fair at on hand. We've got, a, we've got two minutes left, so I'll try and squeeze perhaps one or two more in. Um, so Alison has asked, if someone has difficulty swallowing, um, surely someone with cerebral palsy, for example, uh, should be shielding, but are they on the list? I, I think it's a, it's a little bit difficult to work on a symptom basis. Difficulty swallowing, first thing I would say as a GP is that your GP needs to know that this is the case if they don't already do so, because you would need to have investigations to find out why you're having difficulty swallowing. Now, depending on the reason why you have difficulty swallowing, uh, it would be difficult to kind of put, put a, a broad brush for a kind of uh, thing around this simply because it all depends on what actually is the cause of the difficulty to swallow. And I think dysphagia is just a medical word for difficulty to swallow. We just seen that popped up in the um, in, 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 in the um, uh, chat. Now, it could be because you have excess acid, in which case it's a mild illness and that can be treated with uh, some, uh, some medication, or it could be something more serious, like a motility issue or cancer or something like that, in which case, obviously, yes, you would be in the shielding, in the shielding category. Thank you. Um, 
we've got a minute left and I'm going to have to close the meeting on time today because we've got back-to-back -back meetings this evening. Um, the questions that haven't been answered, we will um, get back to you. Uh, if you want to pop, pop your email in the chat, we will get back to you um, tomorrow. Um, thank you so much for joining and thank you, Riz, as well. Thank you. Um, I just want to end the webinar just to say that we are so desperate to recruit more 18 to 30 year olds as champions. Um, if you know a, a young person or I know perhaps you have a son or a daughter that might be interested, please, please, please let them know about the programme. If you want some resources to share with them, let us know and we can, we can share those with you as well. Um, but yeah, if you, if you can help us, um, that'd be amazing. Um, but yeah, thank you very much. Have a good evening uh, and take care now. Thank you. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye.